Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? Apple's PowerBook 500 series from 1994 proved to be a very popular model with Mac users, despite the fact that it hadn't yet made the leap to PowerPC processors. But this one did, along with some other interesting upgrades. This is a PowerBook 540C, or at least I think it is, as the nameplate has been covered by a sticker we'll talk about in a bit. It's not in the best of shape, unfortunately. The latch that holds the screen closed had broken off, and the flap that covers the floppy drive went missing. In case you've ever wondered if gray plastic can turn yellow like beige parts tend to, the answer is yes, as this keyboard shows. But the worst part is that there was something seriously wrong with the screen. The machine chimed like it should when powered on, and it sounded like the hard drive was being accessed, but the display slowly became washed out and didn't show anything. This likely seemed to be a problem with the LCD panel itself, so to fix it, the machine needed to be taken apart. A pair of Torx T8 screws in the bottom hold the keyboard in place. I flipped the laptop over and lifted it out to reveal the pair of ribbon cables that connect it to the motherboard. These are a little tricky to disconnect as they're stuck between the palm rest and floppy drive, but I could get the connectors unlocked using a spudger. I removed a pair of screws holding down this shield, then turned my attention to the center display cover. I used a spudger to very gently try to pop it loose. These are known to be rather fragile, as the little clips that hold them on become brittle with age. Unfortunately, this one wasn't unscathed. One set of clips on the left side were fine, but the middle ones were half gone, and the right ones seemed to have broken off previously. It's likely I'm not the first person to have removed this. From there, I disconnected the ribbon cable to the display, followed by the microphone wiring, and then took out the screws that hold the front bezel on. The top two screws are covered by rubber bumpers, which surprisingly hadn't turned to goo, unlike the feet on the bottom of the machine. I carefully unclipped the clutch covers, as the tabs that latch them on are equally likely to have become brittle. Then I could remove the screws holding the display to the bottom case, and set it aside. Before I got into troubleshooting the screen, I wanted to investigate a couple of things first. I took out a pair of screws from the back that hold in a plastic cover, which then exposed the third screw in that metal shield. My suspicions were confirmed when I lifted it away. This machine has a CPU upgrade card. PowerBook 500 series machines shipped with Motorola 68LC040 CPUs at either 25 or 33 megahertz. But they came on a removable daughter card, which left open the possibility for future upgrades. A fact that Apple even advertised with a sticker every computer came with. In 1995, Apple delivered on that promise by offering a PowerPC upgrade kit that included a 100 megahertz 603E processor and eight megabytes of RAM. At first, this upgrade was expensive, priced around $800 US, but its launch came at the same time that the 500 series was being discontinued in favor of the new PowerBook 5300, which came with a PowerPC CPU already. With low demand, prices quickly fell to $400 or less. Wikipedia claims that only 6,000 of these upgrades were sold, and while it doesn't cite any sources, that number doesn't seem too far off. What was a bit more popular for 500 series owners were the third-party CPU upgrades that followed. Newer technology sold three versions of its own processor cards, clocking in at 117, 167, and 183 MHz. These weren't cheap, but offered a solid performance boost and were still much less expensive than buying a whole new laptop. But the rarest upgrade was one Apple offered itself. 
likely as a way to clear out remaining inventory after the PowerBook 5300 series launched, the company sold 540C models with the PowerPC card already installed. Called the PowerBook 500 with PowerPC, they were sold only briefly at the end of 1995. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a way to know if this machine is one of those or if it got upgraded by its owner. Some other upgrades did happen, though. It's got a 32 megabyte RAM expansion module, which, when coupled with the 8 megabytes on the CPU card, takes the PowerBook to its 40 megabyte limit. The original hard drive has been swapped out too with a 1 gigabyte unit. But this drive is special. 1 gig SCSI laptop drives were very rare and expensive, even when new. So this Microtech Roadrunner pulls a clever trick. It's actually just a standard IDE hard drive from IBM that has a bridge board attached to the bottom to convert it to SCSI. These were even more expensive than the CPU upgrades, selling for $900 for the 1 gigabyte version or $1,000 for 1.3 gigs. A competitor named SeaWord Technology sold its own version, which by the middle of 1997 became a little more affordable at $600. But if you were a power user and loved your PowerBook 500, it was probably money well spent. Back to the repair. The display's front panel slides forward and lifts off to expose the LCD itself. I disconnected the screen's video cable from the bottom PCB, then its backlight cable from the inverter board. Given their prevalence for failure in vintage computers and the fact that this machine is over 25 years old, I was expecting to find failed electrolytic capacitors on the display's controller board. But this one doesn't have any. Instead, there's a smattering of surface mount solid capacitors, which rarely fail. With those an unlikely culprit, I had no idea what could have been causing the display problem. But I did notice this. The ribbon cable to the screen was a little crooked. I wasn't convinced that this was the source, but I pressed it down firmly, just in case. To fix the broken display latch, I had this another PowerBook 500 that had been earmarked as a parts machine. According to the note on top, it was missing a hard drive and had display issues of its own. But cosmetically, it was in decent shape. The latch was intact and the floppy drive still had its flap. The keyboard had an ominous bulge in the middle, but it hadn't yet turned yellow. This one is a 520C, which came with a passive matrix color screen while the 540C I thought I was working on came with a much better active matrix panel. Out of curiosity, I plugged it in and tried to power it on. The chime meant that it wasn't completely dead and the display lit up, so the backlight was still working. But like with the other laptop, nothing showed on screen. That is, until I tried adjusting the brightness and contrast controls which revealed a blinking floppy icon. This is expected from a Mac with no hard drive, and it means that not only is the motherboard likely okay, but the display itself may be repairable too. But that would need to wait for another day. After removing the keyboard, I found what was causing it to bulge in the middle. This screw simply hadn't been reinstalled all the way. Sadly, the hinge cover wasn't in much better shape on this machine, with the remaining latches cracked and just barely hanging on. I got the display disassembled so I could swap the latch assemblies. It's a bit frustrating that Apple made this part out of a single piece of plastic, which will make it more difficult to come up with a 3D printed replacement eventually. I got the good one swapped into the PowerPC machine's bezel, then I decided to investigate the 520C's LCD while I had it apart. This panel is made by Sharp, and it's a lot more like what I was expecting. There's a neat row of electrolytic caps along the side. Visually, they looked okay, but that doesn't mean they hadn't failed. Regardless, it gave me hope that this 520C would be a viable machine to restore later on. 
For now though, I needed to borrow a couple of parts from it. To make things easy and avoid the risk of breaking more plastic, I decided to just swap the floppy drives between the two machines. On the upgraded laptop, the ribbon cable was held down with ordinary scotch tape, so this may not have been the first time it was worked on. A couple of screws secure it to the chassis, then I could lift it out and disconnect it. Apple had used multiple vendors for many of its parts during this era, so while the 520C's drive was made by Sony, the 540C's drive came from Mitsubishi. While reassembling the laptop for testing, I stopped to check for a common problem. The hinges on this model attach to the rear display housing through a couple of plastic standoffs. But to my surprise, they were still intact on both sides. It's possible to install 3D printed replacements if they break, but I was thankful that was something I could skip, at least for now. I put the machine back together only enough to see if the display problem was still there. I expected it to be, so my expectations were low. But then this happened. What in a way? I couldn't believe it. Reseating that connector was all it took and the machine was booting without a problem into Mac OS 8. The hard drive did indeed report as being one gigabyte in size, though the where field in the git info box confirmed a suspicion I had with its reference to FWB. The Apple menu had an alias to the FWB mounter application, though it wasn't working. And while its name suggests a crass joke, this program would become quite relevant a bit later on. I pressed on with reassembling the PowerBook. I got the display housing put back together and the cables reconnected. I dropped in the replacement floppy drive and got it secured, then reinstalled the middle cover on the lower housing. I reattached the display and carefully clipped the clutch covers back in. I decided that I'd deal with the broken latches on the hinge cover another day and gently got it seated. It seemed to be staying in place just fine anyway. The last bit to sort out was the keyboard. The part off the 520C was clearly the way to go given that it still had its original color. I got its ribbon cables installed, then the keyboard screwed back in. Based on the quality of the screen image, it definitely seemed like this machine had an active matrix panel, which meant it likely was a 540C as I suspected. But the big question now was, how much did that PowerPC card help performance? Apple System Profiler reported the upgrade card correctly, and on paper it was three times as fast as the 33MHz 68LC040 the computer shipped with. But PowerPC processors were more efficient per clock cycle, so the potential performance gap could be even greater. Only one way to find out, and that was to run some benchmarks. I started by installing MacBench 4, which also served as a good test of the replacement floppy drive. I was happy to see it was working fine. But when I tried to launch it, it just froze, getting stuck on the splash screen. I chalked this up to an OS problem and decided to wipe the hard drive and reinstall OS 8. I launched drive setup and as I expected, it detected the drive but refused to format it. During this era, Apple put special firmware on its SCSI hard drives and its disk utility programs were locked down to only work with them. Since this machine had a third party replacement drive, it needed to be formatted with a third party tool. And that explains the whole FWB thing from earlier. FWB software made a number of utility programs for the Mac, and one of them was Hard Disk Toolkit. It could check drives for errors, but perhaps its most useful feature was that it could format non-Apple drives. It wasn't the only option for doing so, though. Another popular utility was Lissy's Silver Lining tool, which I already had on Floppy. It found the drive without a problem, but when I went to format it, silver lining just crashed. I had one more trick up my sleeve. Long ago, Mac power users figured out how to hack the official Apple HDSC setup utility to bypass its firmware check, so it would work on any drive. 
Sure enough, it had no problems formatting this one, so I could proceed with reinstalling the OS. But afterwards, the same problem. MacBench 4 just froze. I figured maybe it was something about that version, so I tried installing MacBench 3 as well. But it did the same thing, and I had no idea why. Maybe the SCSI hard drive adapter does something weird that trips it up, which could potentially also explain the problem with silver lining. So I switched to another benchmarking tool called Speedometer, which launched without a problem. But what would I compare this machine to? I didn't have the original 540C's CPU card, but I did have a machine that would put up an even more interesting fight. I had previously restored a PowerBook 550C, a fairly rare machine only sold in Japan. Aside from its larger screen and jet black case, it came with one key upgrade over the other 500 series models. Its 33 MHz 040 processor included a floating point unit. FPUs were fairly desirable features to have during this era as they can make certain math calculations much faster. And the benchmarks showed this. Running the benchmark mix on the 550 gave an average result of 1.8. The baseline 1.0 rating refers to the Quadra 605 desktop, which had a slower 25 MHz 68 LC040 without an FPU. So an 80% speed improvement was not something to be overlooked. The performance test broke this down further with a score of 1.162 for the CPU and almost 20 for the FPU. Then it was time to run the test on the upgraded 540C. While Speedometer didn't report the correct CPU in the machine, I think this was just a display bug. The application itself was definitely PowerPC native. And the results bore this out with an average benchmark score of 14.8. That big jump was largely due to the FPU though, as the performance test showed the true numbers. Math operations scored a blistering 166, but the raw CPU score was just a bit above 4. While that means this 100 MHz PowerPC chip is four times as fast as the 25 MHz baseline Quadra model, it also reveals a major limitation in the upgrade. It simply wasn't as fast as it could have been. The problem is that simply enough, the rest of the PowerBook was a performance bottleneck. The bus speed of the motherboard was set with the 040 in mind, as was the refresh rate of the RAM. This, coupled with the fact that the upgrade card itself lacked any level 2 cache, meant that your newly supercharged PowerBook 500 was still a bit slower than other Mac models at the same clock speed. That wasn't necessarily the worst thing, though. The PowerBook 5300 wasn't very well received and was plagued by build quality issues. But 500 series owners generally loved their machines, so for those looking for better performance, an upgrade card made for a good compromise. It was cheaper than buying a whole new computer and avoided all the 5300's problems and shortcomings. It's clear that this machine's previous owner certainly understood this, given all the upgrades it received. No doubt it served them well for a number of years, despite the breakneck pace of technology during the 90s. This PowerBook is a fantastic time capsule of what computing was like for dedicated Mac users in an era when Apple was not at its best. And arguably, it was such dedication that kept the company going. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.